Okay. Uh, I had to take a little break there, but uh, Thursday's lesson. Uh, true repentance and confession. What principles do we learn from Leviticus 5.5? 5? Let's look at it. Leviticus chapter 5, verse 5. And let's see. And it shall be when he is guilty in any of these matters that he shall confess that he has sinned in that thing. You could tell that there was a notion in the, in the, in the Mosaic period of ancient Israel. You could tell that these Hebrews, they had a notion of corporate repentance because look what it says. And it shall be when he is guilty in any of these matters that he shall confess that he has sinned in that thing. Nobody, there's not this attitude today. We don't have this type of atmosphere or ecosystem of repentance and confession. You could be a pastor. You could uh, be a conference official. You could steal all the money you really want. Uh, but you never really have to repent. You really don't. Now, if you get caught, though, it's like it's, it's like an expected thing that you at least go through the form of repentance. You know, maybe you got to cry, depending on how serious it will. People believe what you did was. But it's it, that's really not a spirit of repentance and confession. There ought to be a spirit of convi conviction, uh, confession and repentance in your home. Is there? Is everything glossed over? Do you want your children? Now, you shouldn't force people to say they're sorry. But do you do you employ your children to be sorry? Do you study about these things? If you have a spirit in your family where people don't want to say them sorry, you better you better really deal with that. They won't then they're not sorry. I'm sorry. No, no that's not sorry. <laughs> that's obstinance. That's being incorrigible. Uh, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, the Bible says he is faithful and just to forgive of our sin in all unrighteousness. In Isaiah chapter 1, verse 16 through 18, wash yourself, make yourselves clean, put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do good. Seek justice, rebuke the oppressed, rebuke the oppressors. You never see that. You never see these leaders rebuke other leaders that are oppressors. The Bible says that those that the elders that sin openly rebuke them before everybody that all may fear. When was the last time you seen that happen? Not behind the person's back in a face like Paul did Peter. When do you see that happen? You don't see it happen. Tares don't really believe that you should be rebuking other tares. Why? They on the same team. They work for the same devil. They can't be outing each other. That's why you never see this in any denomination. Any denomination. Cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, rebuke the oppressor, defend the fatherless, plead for the widows. Who have you seen pleading for widows in any denomination? Especially the Seventh-day Adventists or Laodicea. Have you ever seen the Laodicean angel or leadership pleading for widows? They don't do it. What they're doing with widows is this, trying to get all the money they can get out of them because they know that they at the end of their life and they are really expendable. Who do you see asking God to corporately forgive them of that? 3ABN got set up to get, got it set up where they can get all get the money uh, annuities got the money we're doing the same stuff the world we're pulling the same scheme God has already set up a system by which if it was run properly There'll be plenty of money to do everything, but we got to set up annuities and stuff. We're about to turn each one of these denominations into a bank, a mutual fund. 
<laughs> and we're going to do it in Jesus' name and with the power of the Holy Ghost. Wow. Money schemes, 3ABN. The three angels message. There ain't no three angels message. Let these old people get that money to their families for an inheritance. Let them use that money to evangelize their family. Y'all going to take the money and siphon off of it. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. And I believe that's oppressive what 3ABN is doing. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widows. Come now and let us reason together. Repentance. Let's go to Thursday's lesson. What was it? Wednesday's. Yeah, true and false repentance contrasts. There are some specific examples in the Bible of people who sought repentance but were not forgiven by God. They wept, they were sorrowful, they confessed their sins but were not forgiven. I keep thinking about regional conferences and stuff. Regional conferences means that we don't love each other. That's, that's declaring to the world and to heaven. We don't love each other. We got regional conferences. And we're going to hold two re re regional conferences so we can keep the power that we got so we don't have to share it. And so we can make sure that our black pastors get some money. Because if we get with some white pastors, we won't have the positions that we have. We're going to be stepchild in our own uh, among our own race, we don't but we don't love each other if we have regional conferences, y'all. And 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 up, there are other denominations that got regional conferences, but they just not they just not say it straight out as regional conferences. The account of Pharaoh and, and the regional conferences is as much against what white people do. As it is against black people. Black people don't trust the white people and they want to they want to pimp the, the black people in their conferences versus allowing white people to come in who are racist and pimp the black members. They're like, well, we might as well pimp them myself. You, you, hey, y'all, this stuff really happens. We're going to refinance their churches. And let the and, 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 and let the Johns be the banks. I'm telling you, it's crazy what these churches are doing. Every denomination pimping its members, every one. Church is getting a loan to build the house of God. That don't even sound right. If I was if I was a crackhead and never heard nothing about God, I would know that that's something wrong with that. Yeah, the church is going to go apply for a loan so it can build the house of God. So the so God's people can get together and worship God. It don't make sense, y'all. One phase of the he one phrase in Hebrews 12, 17 sums it up well. For you know that afterwards, when I wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found not place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. It sums up well, Esau, speaking of Esau, the passage says that when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he repented like Pharaoh, Balaam and Judas, Esau. So this means that all these denominations today are worse than all these guys I'm reading about. When was the last time you ever heard of a denomination repenting of its sin? You just don't hear of that. It don't exist, y'all. Esau's heart was not broken. And because it don't happen on that level. See, the problem with not having corporate repentance is that it has a trickle down effect in people's personal lives that are part of whatever denomination. They really don't believe in repentance. They give lip service to it. Yeah, they have a Sabbath school lesson like this about it, but they really don't believe in it. Corporate repentance. 
must be. He was sorry that he had not. And, and let me tell you something. Just because the denomination or the denominations, whatever denomination you're a part of, doesn't repent of his sins corporately, have it in your home. Individually report, re, uh, re, repent of your sins. Individually repent as a couple, a married couple. In, repent as a family. Lay before your children this example of corporate repentance in the home. And particularly name things that y'all are doing as a family. I'm not saying that this is a time for you to come out with your personal sins that people, nobody needs to hear. And make people uncomfortable and embarrassed. No. Corporate repentance is about corporate sin only. Individual and private repentance should stay that. Individual and private. There's wisdom here, y'all. The spirit of prophecy, it brings wisdom. The law, and when I say the spirit of prophecy, I'm not talking about a book. I'm talking about a spirit. The law of sowing and reaping is a divine law. It is true that sin brings dire consequences, but repentance is not consumed with the negative results of sin. It is concerned instead with the dishonor and sorrow that our sin has brought to God. Let me tell you this. I want to give you a good definition of sin because I don't think we really get the definition of what sin is. Uh yeah, we know sin is the transgression of the law. But there's so much more inferred right there when it says sin is the transgression of the law. Sin is the transgression of the laws that govern God's kingdom. That's what sin really is. So when we repent, we repent of all those sins that are contrary to God's kingdom. To building up God's kingdom. We repent of anything that we do. That would frustrate. The galvanization. Of God's kingdom in the earth. So getting loans. Getting loans will not build up the kingdom of God. It's a sin. Why? Why? Because it does the total opposite of what would galvanize, grow, and dominate everything in the earth with God's kingdom. That's how you know it's a sin. It don't have to be just adultery, fornication, lying, cheating, stealing. Going and getting a loan from the world? When God said you're going to be the lender and not the borrower. See, being the lender in God's kingdom and not the borrower, that will grow God's kingdom. You, you, do you see that? Do you hear my spirit, y'all? This is not just about money. It's about principles. It's about spiritual concepts that carnal people just can't grasp because they're not born again because spiritually things are spiritually discerned. If you're not born of the spirit, which means born of the Holy Spirit, which is the spirit of truth, you can't understand what I'm saying. You're fighting right now. See, when when the I want to go ahead. All this loan and money on an individual basis and as in the corporate sense of the, the churches is a great sin. It's an abomination. We're making a God out of the bank. We're making the bank and we're making the leaders of the church as pimps. And we're making the banking system as a John, a customer. And we're making the church out of harlot. The law of sowing and reaping is a divine law. It is true that sin brings dire consequences, but repentance is not consumed with the negative results of sin. It is concerned. See, when I see sin, I see laws that govern the kingdom of God. So it can dominate and rule and have dominion. That's what sin is to me. Yes, sin is the transgression of the law that governs God's kingdom that it might dominate in the earth. That's my definition of sin, people. 
It is concerned instead with the dishonor and sorrow that our sin has brought to God. Yeah, we bring dishonor to his kingdom. And when we bring dishonor to God's kingdom, we bring dishonor to God. Why? Because it's the kingdom of God, of God. True repentance is always characterized at least characterized by at least three things. First, a sorrow that our sin has broken God's heart. We are hurt because we hurt the one who loves us so much. And you know what? When you break the laws that govern God's kingdom, that is breaking God's heart. Because at the, the heart of God is his character. And the law is a transcript of his character. So when you break the law, you break the law of God. We have this happening in every denomination. From the way that we choose pastors, from the way that we finance our churches, from the way that we counsel our members, the, 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 they call members, but they really should be citizens of the kingdom on how to handle their personal finance. There is a honest confession of the specific sin that we have committed. True repentance is not laced with excuses for our behavior. It does not place blame on someone else. It takes responsibility for our action. Third, true repentance always includes, excuse me, a decision to turn away from our sin. There can be no genuine repentance unless there is a corresponding reformation in the life. False repentance, on the other hand, is self-centered. It is concerned with the consequences of sin. It is an emotional state of sorrow because our sin. You know, look, look at this. The reason why uh, this uh, false repentance is concerned with the consequences of sin because these type of people are really concerned with not building up God, Satan's kingdom. So they real sin consequence uh, absorbed. They really absorbed about the consequences of sin. Why? Because they are basically there to do the devil's work. And they don't want that work of Satan uh, frustrated. So that's one of the reasons. Now, they don't know this, but that's just how sin works. And sin is the transgression of the laws that govern God's kingdom. So it can dominate in the earth, in every area of life. It is an emotional state of sorrow because our sin often brings negative consequences. You know, the Bible says that the love of money is the root of all evil. But all Christians don't believe they love money. But guess what? They all got loans. <laughs> they all got stuff that ain't paid for. They all slaves to the bank. From their home to their car, even their education, what's in their head, they ain't even got that paid for. And but guess what? You pay a premium when you're a slave to sin or debt. Because you got to pay interest whenever you're in sin. When you're trying to play it, pay it in the flesh. Thursday's lesson, confessing. Confession's healing power. Confession laces the boil of guilt. I'm sorry. Confession lances the boil of guilt and allows the poisonous pus of sin to drain. Confession is healing in many ways. But a lot of times you can confess of stuff and you will get punished. So I don't, you know, I don't know what picture, you know, everything is not hunky dory just because you confess. Things will can get him uncomfortable. It opens our heart to receive God's grace. Through confession, we accept the forgiveness that Christ freely offers us from the cross. Through confession. The Adventist church has never confessed. At any of these general conference sessions, they, they just don't believe in it. To me, that's like going in God's face and like popping your collar. Pop! You come into God in, a, in, 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 in the setting of a world's, world's, world setting. The world church is coming together and you don't repent of one single thing. Not one elder get on their face. 
and specifically mention sins that they know they're guilty of. They don't believe in it. Uh, confession also breaks down barriers between us and other people. When you have these camp meetings, never do anybody get on their face and repent about sins that the conferences are doing or the regional conferences are doing. No, I never went to a camp meeting and heard them uh, um, repent of having re re regional conference. I never heard any in, in any white conference they repenting because they won't can't get along with people in regional conferences there's no there's no reconciliation there and in this regional conference thing it's really all about a money grab and power grab uh, Psalms 23 1 through 8 what does this teach us about confession and repentance look at this Loma Linda University some many years ago they put a baboon heart in this little girl or whatever. They never repented of that. Uh, Loma Linda, uh, the, the, the hospital and a university, they spearheaded anencephalic baby uh, transplants and stuff. Never repented of that. They don't believe it. They don't believe in repentance. They don't believe in it stem cell research and abortions. The Adventist hospitals are never going to repent of abortions. Never. Now that's corporate. That's something that we know go on. By hook or by crook. You're never going to hear the leaders in any conference repent of all the babies that were killed in the name of Jesus under the three angels message, we're not going to do it. It's too embarrassing. Catholic hospitals, they're not going to repent. Pentecostals, Baptist hospitals, they're never going to repent of the abortions that they do. Oh, well, they don't do abortions. Yeah, they send you somewhere else to get the abortion done. You know why? Because it's law. They're not going to repent. The, none of these churches are going to repent of being whores of the government. They never going to repent of that. Nobody wants. That's too embarrassing. See, they more see the wicked are always concerned about consequence. They're not concerned about the Lord. The apostle Paul strove for a conscience. Void of offense towards God and towards man. What does that mean? Well, I can't comment on everything. Let's keep going. Is guilt good or bad? It all depends. If the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin and the guilt of the sin drives us to Jesus, guilt is good. Now, let me comment on this. Drives us to Jesus. What, what is driving you to Jesus look like? Is it just getting on your knees and praying? No. Building his kingdom. And I noticed that a lot of people think they're repenting. Guess what? They live the same way they always did. And I really, really believe they might feel sorry. But it don't drive them to 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 live different. It don't they don't get innovative ways on how to build up God's kingdom in a practical way. Like not getting. Loans. Guilt is good. If we have already confessed our sin and continue to feel guilty, the guilt may become destructive. This this feeling of guiltless guiltness must be laid at the foot of the cross of Calvary. How do you know you laid your sin? Start engaging in the opposite of whatever sin it is that will cause you to build up his kingdom in whatever way, whether it's sexual sin whether it's attitude, whether it's evil surmising, evil thinking, lying. Start building up the kingdom in each one of those areas by doing the opposite of what the sin calls you to do. And the opposite thing that you start doing, it literally and practically starts building up the kingdom of God. You are mine. Your weakness will be, sh will I, sh 
Your weakness will I will strengthen. Your remorse of sin I will remove. The answer, uh, and that's in Manuscript Releases, Volume 9, page 305. The answer to guilt is Jesus. Yeah, it's Jesus. It's not just a picture of Jesus or a cross on your chest. It's the, the answer to guilt is Jesus' kingdom. His grace abolishes the destructive guilt sin lays upon us. Why does God give us grace? Grace is an opportunity, an undeserved opportunity that God grants to us to continue to work in his vineyard and build up his kingdom so it could dominate the world. That's what grace is for. That's how you know you're seeking Jesus with the grace that he has given you. You're going to be building up his kingdom diligently. How has guilt impacted our relationship with the Lord and with others? What can we do to help to alleviate the burden of guilt that you carry? Even if you have done wrong and the guilt is in a sense justified. What promise can you claim from the Bible to help you to move on? I'm going to give you mine. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And when I say seek ye first, see, I'm giving y'all present truth. This is real present truth. I'm taking old things and I'm showing them to you in a new light that you've never seen before. Seek ye first the kingdom of God means seek only the kingdom of God. It don't mean it means don't look to work for any other kingdom. Christians don't believe this either. They believe when they say you provide a living, they mean they think that means that, OK, you got to go work for the banks by getting loans, loading yourself down with loans and then work for employers who don't even believe in God. You work for them 20, 40 years, give them all 20, 40, 20, 40 or 30 years of your soul. And then you take a little bit of tithe or offerings if you're doing that, and then you throw that to God. And God's kingdom is not getting as big as these kingdoms that we work for, for hourly or, or, or wage or salary. How? OK, so I will answer that Friday's lesson in conclusion. Confession will be accepted. Confession will not be acceptable to God without sincere repentance and reformation. There must be decided change in the life. Everything offensive to God must be put away. You know, there was a statement I wanted to read in Christ's Object Lesson. I think it's page 330, paragraph two. Man. I can't think of what the statement says, though. It's in my head. It kind of sounds like the one we just read here. But anyway, there must be decided change in the life. Everything offensive to God must be put away. This will be God, what is the statement says something like, God will only accept those who are determined. Man, I can't think of the rest of it. God will only accept those who, who are determined. Hold on a second. I can't think of it. But if you go to... uh. Christ's object lessons in the chapter entitled The Talents. I think it's page 330, paragraph two, somewhere up in there, two to four or whatever. You're going to find this statement. And when you find it, please leave it, leave leave a comment in the comment section down, down here. OK, but this is a good statement here. Confession will not be accepted to God without sincere repentance and reformation. Christians do not believe this. You know why? Because they always say there is no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. They don't believe. And Seventh-day Adventists also believe there's no condemnation. I heard this one pastor say, I don't care what you've seen me do. He had this type of attitude. I don't care what you saw me do. God is still with me. That looked like a sorrowful spirit and nobody was even asking him nothing. 
So guilt could also make you arrogant. Why? Because you're not really sorry. It won't have you obsess over your guilt. It will have you obsess over the fact that it, it, will, it can cause you to be obstinate. There must be decided change in the life. Everything offensive to God must be put away. Christians don't believe that. Look at, in, no, I, I don't see no denomination that believes that. This will be the result of genuine sorrow for sin. You know, in the last Sabbath school lesson for uh, lesson five, in the beginning of the lesson, they were saying that uh, this guy at the beginning of the lesson, I can't remember what his name was, but they said his Pentecostal movement where they were speaking in tongues and all that kind of stuff. In the Sabbath school lesson, they say that was genuine. That was definitely genuine revival. But Ellen G. White says mm -mm, it was fanaticism. We don't we are not repenting. We're actually going deeper into sin. As Christians, period, in the United States, we have built up a network of sin that is poised to distribute the mark of the beast in the name of Jesus. Pentecostals, Baptists, Lutherans, Seventh-day Adventists, Worldwide Church of God, whatever. Mormons, Buddhists, Hindu, they all going to give the mark of the beast and they're going to use their pastors, their their shamas, their whoever, their sages to do it. The seven day Adventist church. Is set up already, it's got all the things in order. To legislate the mark of the beast, you know what the mark of the beast really is, y'all. It's sin transgression of the laws that govern the kingdom of God. That's what really sin is. That's the mark of the beast is really sin. But anyway, wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes, cease to do evil. Sound like the lead to sin message to me. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. <laughs> There's no condemnation. They're not seeking judgment. And Adventists, they, they, they give lip service to seeking. The, they, God's going to judge the world. Guess what they are not seeking? They are not seeking their own judgment. Mm. See the big difference? They think the three angels' message is there just so God could judge the world. No, the Bible says judgment must first come to the house of God. Right here where it says seek judgment. And look what scripture is being quoted. Isaiah 1, 16 through 17. Isaiah was talking to God's people. Seek him to judge you, Isaiah was basically saying. Adventists don't look for them to judge them, God. You know why? Because every denomination believes there's no condemnation. To them that are in a false Christ. If the wicked restore the pledge, give again that he have robbed. Walk in the statutes of life without committing iniquity. He shall surely live. He shall not die. But anyway, this is lesson six. Hey, y'all, we in big trouble. Have, you know, today we're going to repent of some things in this family. This Sabbath, we're going to repent. We're going to get on our face and we're going to repent. We might even do some feet washing right here at home. You don't, you don't wash feet at home? Why? If you don't bring Jesus in your home and these things that we do outside of the home, it means that what you're doing outside ain't really real. It, no matter how sincere you are, it's not real. It's a matrix. Why don't you feet wash at home? Wash your wife's feet. Let her wash your feet. Wash your children's feet. Have communion at home. Not, I'm not saying only at home. But have communion at home with your children. Some Sabbaths just stay home. Find some, schedule some Sabbath where y'all just stay home and y'all worship together. 
If you're not having worship at home, you are not a true worshiper. God wants to come and live with you. Where do you live at? At the church house? No, you live at home. When the Bible says, forsake not yourselves, the assembling together it is the, as it is the manner of some, it's not just talking about the place outside home. It's talking about forsake not the assembling of yourselves together at home too. We always apply it to a place outside of our house. And that is right. But you can't apply it only to a place outside of your house. Because if you do that, you're not a true worshiper. You're not a true Christian. You're not a true nothing. In Christ. Worship at home. Wash your wife's for feet for the first time. Baptize your own kids. They're yours. You're supposed to be discipling. You're supposed to teach them God's law diligently, the Bible says in Deuteronomy 6. But anyway, I'm going to end this video. This is Prophet 6, Family Prophet. Hey, y'all. This is in love, y'all. It's rough. It's tough. But it's love. It is in love, y'all. The only way that people that are tears are going to be saved is going to have to be prompted by love. Whether they can detect it or not, there's going to have to be a, a motive of love there. The tears are going to go to hell. That's where they, they allocate it to. They're going to be bound in bundles to be burned. And the ones that's bound in bundles first are the tears. But anyway, God bless you. This is Prophet 6, family prophet to the angel of the church of the lay of the sin. If you're watching this on the Sabbath, have a good Sabbath. And if you're watching this right before the next Sabbath, uh, which is uh, week six, God bless you um, for that too. I don't know what I just said. But anyway, I need to end this video. Bye. <laughs> Praise God.